thanks for joining us again here at the Freeman Spogli Institute, at least the virtual Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. I'm Michael McFall, the director. Uh, and today are we are going to formally launch a new white paper out of FSI called Global Populisms and Their Challenges. Uh, we had originally intended to do this out of Encina, our beautiful uh, hall that we have, uh, out of uh, Bechtel uh, and, and Encina, this beautiful hall that I know many of you have been to and we were planning to come out on the patio afterwards and have drinks in our lovely new patio. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that this time, although maybe we'll do it in the fall if we get the chance. Uh, the upside of not doing it in Bechtel is we have over 600 people with us today, uh, which Bechtel couldn't accommodate. And so thank you all for being here today. I'm honored to be here with my three co-authors, uh, Ana Jamal Busa, Didi Kuo, and Frank Fukuyama. We'll be, taking about, we'll be talking about the nature of global populism's threats and potential solutions for its rise around the world. Uh, this paper is the result of a global populisms project that are, 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 we've all been working on together, but especially Anna and Didi. I encourage you to go to the website afterwards, first to download the paper, but also to see all of the many papers that have been written over the course of a couple of years and three conferences that you can find at the website. I think Anna will say more about that in a minute. Let me first introduce our panelists. They'll speak for about 10 or 15 minutes each, and then we'll get to your questions. First up is Professor Ana Jamal Abusa, who is a senior fellow and director of the Europe Center here at the Freeman Spogli Institute. She's also in the Department of Political Science with me. Next up, we have uh, Professor Dr. Didi Kuo, who is the Associate Director of Research and Senior Research Scholar at the Center on Democracy Development and Rule of Law, also a center at FSI. And last but not least, we have Dr. Professor uh, I don't know how I got into all these titles. Uh, Frank Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama, who is the Olivier Nomolini Senior Fellow at FSI. He's also the Mossbacher Director of the Center on Democracy Development and Rule of Law. Again, one of the centers here at FSI. And he's also the Director of our Masters in International Policy Program uh, based at FSI. So what we'll do, we'll each speak for about 10 minutes and then we'll move to the Q&A button uh, it'll be down at the bottom, and if you start sending me your questions now, I'll try to curate them and keep the most interesting ones. No, I'll keep, I'll actually ask the most interesting ones first and keep the least interesting ones for last. So let me now hand over the virtual Zoom microphone to Anna to take it away. Great. Thank you, Mike. Um, this white paper is the result of the Global Populisms Project here at Stanford University, uh, generally supported by the Hewlett Foundation. And over the last three years, we've collected a whole bunch of data, supported a lot of research, and held several conferences that examined the different facets of populism. Um, and as Mike mentioned, the papers from these conferences, as well as other publications, are available on our website. Um, and there will also be uploading more articles and databases this summer. So this has been a very interesting, productive, and fun collaboration. And what I'll do now is to briefly introduce the paper to you um, and our findings. So to get us started, um, I first wanted to define what populism is and how we use that term in the paper. We follow Cass Moody, 2004, and basically argue that populist parties and politicians make two sets of claims. One, they view the elites as a corrupt and self-serving cartel. And by elites, we mean political elites, business elites, the media, and so on. Secondly, populist parties and politicians claim that as a result, we need to better represent the people as such. So this is a very flexible um, and very thin set of claims. It's important to note what populism is not. It's not redistribution, it's not self-government, and it's not nationalism or nativism. However, because it only makes these two claims, it's compatible with both left and right. And as a result, partly because it's open to the parties and leaders worldwide. It's been spreading around the globe and increasing in support. Um, in everywhere from Hungary to Turkey um, to the Philippines. As we can see, even in the oldest and most developed democracies in Europe, we see an increase in the votes for populist parties. In the older democracies, which are on the green line on the bottom, we see that support for populist parties has more than tripled since the 1990s. In the newer democracies, the sort of post-communist democracies that gained their freedom in the 1989, 1989 
we see that popular support is higher and it more than doubles over the course of the last 20 to 30 years. So of course, we want to know the causes of this. Why do we observe this alarming rise in support for populist parties? And scholars have focused on the economy and the way in which economic crises and economic shifts make people much more vulnerable on immigration and the threats to both labor markets and to cultural identities that they pose, and on the international diffusion of populism, on sponsorship by Russia and other actors. But what we focus on in this paper, above all, is the failure of mainstream parties. So what does this failure look like? Well, by mainstream parties, we mean the centrist parties of governance, the Democratic and Republican Party in the United States, the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats in Europe, and so on. And what these parties basically have developed is a perception among the voters of an elite policy consensus, that these parties are basically indistinguishable from each other in their commitment to elite interests, to market solutions, um, to the desirability of international institutions and forces such as the EU or globalization, and so on. And as a result, they're seen as having failed to respond to popular concerns. They're basically seen as floating above society and utterly uninterested in the fears and worries of everyday voters. They're basically seen as complacent and indifferent. And as a result of this, populist parties capitalize on this. They point out this consensus. And what they argue is that as a result, mainstream parties don't speak for the people, as Nigel Farage argued in the run up to the Brexit referendum, that it's better to cancel all parties um, as you can see by the crossed out election posters, posters in Italy. And it also means that populists agree that you might as well vote for the populists rather than for the other parties, because what do you have to lose? The problem is that the consequences of populist governance, of populist parties in government, are dire for democracy. First, they attack the formal institutions of democracy. They view them as not to be trusted because they're the creatures of this elite cartel. And as a result, populist governments attack the courts, they attack regulatory agencies, they attack the free media, government watchdogs, and so on. Secondly, these parties, once in power, violate informal norms of democracy, of transparency, of moderation, of accountability, viewing them as elitist and irrelevant. And finally, what these parties do is to divide societies into their loyalist supporters, who are the real people, and the opposition, who are traitorous and treasonous, almost by definition. And this is a pattern that we observe almost everywhere we see populist parties in power, whether it's Venezuela or Turkey or Poland or Hungary, the pattern holds. So of course, the question is, what do we do about this? And in the paper, we argue that if mainstream political parties are part of the problem, they also can be part of the solution. And so we point out three different areas in which mainstream political parties can basically reclaim democracy um, and reclaim, reclaim the protection of formal institutions and informal norms of democracy. The first of these ways is in their rhetoric, in a reclaiming of patriotism, of the rule of law, and a concern first and foremost with the integrity of democracy itself. Secondly, we argue that parties can expand their coalitions First of all, they need to become more responsive to voters, to invest more in local democracy, for example, in local institutions and in local governments. And secondly, they need to protect democracy from elites who would otherwise corrode it. For example, in France in 2017, um, elites, so elite politicians basically erected a cordon sanitaire around Marine Le Pen to prevent her from being elected as president because she was seen as an extremist populist. And finally, we point to <coughs> solutions, to institutional solutions. We can do something about electoral security, a political districting, um, greater transparency in party funding, and maybe perhaps even more ambitious solutions such as ranked choice voting. So with that, I'll conclude this introduction to the white paper. Both the paper and more information can be found at this link. Um, if you're interested, um, please download the paper and um, acquaint yourself more with the project. And so thank you very much. And with that, I will turn it over to my friend and colleague, Didi Kuo, who will talk about populism in America. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna, and thanks to everyone for tuning in today. Um, I'm going to shift gears to talk about the United States, which we often think has exceptional politics. But this report itself was driven by similarities that we see across populist leaders, both in their sort of rhetoric and style, as well as the substance of what they do once elected to office, 
which typically is very bad for democracy. And some of these similarities have become amplified or clarified in the COVID crisis in particular. Um, so I'll briefly discuss the ways that the Trump administration is following a populist playbook, which, as Anna noted, has corrosive effects on democracy. I'll discuss the historical context in which populism has emerged in the United States. And finally, some potential solutions along the lines of those that uh, Anna was just discussing. So first, a quick reminder that democracies are, in fact, vulnerable to, um, to movements like populism. First, because they require buy-in from political actors about the legitimacy of the democratic process, as well as requiring the free flow of information, populist leaders tend to attack both of those and sometimes can dismantle formal institutions or at least sow enough distrust in the population that it can be bad for both the short and long-term consequences of democracy. Further, democracies are susceptible to gradual erosion over time. It's very unlikely that even in some of the countries with very successful populist leaders that they're automatically authoritarian overnight. Rather, we typically see a pattern of what Nancy Romeo has called executive aggrandizement and manipulation of elections that over time can go far to undermine the formal and informal practices of democracy. So the Trump administration, for example, since 2016, have um, two in two ways really gone after formal institutions. The first is they've attacked elections themselves, the electoral process in the United States. And the second is they've undermined the rule of law, especially through the way that they uh, enact policy and the preferential treatment given to some supporters and loyalists over others. On the election front, uh, even when he was elected in 2016, Trump still claimed that there was fraud in the 2016 election. He often threatened to jail his opponent, Hillary Clinton. And now, in the context of COVID-19, which represents a serious threat to elections as they're typically conducted in the United States, i.e. in person, in polling places that may be crowded or have long lines, we know that we're going to require new sets of uh, infrastructure and practices to manage this year's presidential election. But Trump has already started to lay the groundwork for some kind of contestation or delegitimation of the election result. He has attacked mail-in ballots as fraudulent, so much so that yesterday the platform Twitter, on which he communicates with all of us, um, issued a little warning sign saying that his claims about mail-in ballots uh, were potentially incorrect and for more information, click here, which has started sort of a whole new fight between him and the platform itself. But at the very least, he has gone after the Secretary of State of Michigan, the governor of California for sending out mail-in ballots. He has attacked the United States Postal Service, which would likely be the vehicle through which our mail-in ballots are counted um, and threatened to defund it. And even aside from the question of mail-in ballots, he has said in a recent special election in California that opening precincts in areas that were unlikely to vote Republican was equivalent to stealing ballots and that the votes from those precincts shouldn't be counted. And so we see any number of ways that he has tried to undermine the legitimacy of elections in the United States. And on the formal institutions front, we know that Trump has gone after the media, he's gone after courts, he's gone after anyone who opposes him, especially uh, in Congress. But he's also made loyalty one of the foremost criteria for an executive appointment to work in his cabinet. He's fired a series of inspectors general in the federal government across the departments who have investigated his administration or blown the whistle on practices that they found to be potentially illegal, raising real rule of law issues. Um, during the COVID crisis, many populist leaders have sidelined scientists and experts. He has at the very least denied that COVID is a real problem and promoted drugs that likely have no effect on um, coronavirus infections. And he's also potentially using his office to enrich his, his own interests, his family or his closest allies. He's tried to wrest oversight from Congress over the disbursement of pay, paycheck protection funds and SBA loans. He wanted the Secretary of Treasury to be able to disburse those funds in secret. He appointed his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, to oversee the distribution of PPE and other federal resources to the states, once again saying that states that are loyal are the ones that will get a call back from the federal government. Um, and so there are any number of sort of ethics and abuse of public office questions that have really come to the fore in this presidency. Um, now, as Anna discussed, one of the ways populism has emerged across Europe is through the rise of populist parties. In the United States, populism is more likely to emerge as a faction within one of our two dominant parties. And in 2016, we saw populism emerge both on the right with the candidacy of Donald Trump and on the left to a lesser or somewhat different extent with the candidacy of Bernie Sanders. 
Um, and it's just important to note that the context in which populism happened in the United States as it was sort of becoming widespread in other advanced democracies really does get at questions about citizens' disconnection or feeling of uh, the government being unresponsive to their interests. Since the 1990s, um, since the 1980s actually, political polarization and economic inequality have been on the rise in the United States. American citizens have said on public opinion surveys that they distrust Congress, for example, they distrust the political parties, um, they think that politicians are more likely to serve special interests. This is despite the fact that in the 1990s there was a lot of agreement about democracy being the best form of government and there was widespread growth, uh, economic growth and prosperity, but those gains weren't equally shared in the population. Especially after the 2008 financial crisis, we know that both parties have embraced a similar economic agenda of globalization, deregulation, uh, financialization, while some so some sectors have thrived like the knowledge economy or those of us who can work from home during this crisis for example while traditional manufacturing labor unions have been on the decline and the balance of power between labor and capital has shifted in ways that leave many american workers and communities worse off we also have an increasingly diverse society which frank will talk about in just a second but there are some real issues being raised that americans perceive politicians as being unable to address or have not have refused to negotiate or compromise on in ways that satisfy what american majorities may want from their government um, so quickly to talk about potential solutions we've thought about some institutional reforms that might mitigate some of the populist tendencies in the united states not only the importance of leaders talking openly about uh, the need to shore up democratic institutions but also potentially um, improving election administration in the u.s which remains highly decentralized and administered in a partisan fashion at the state level ranked choice voting which would encourage candidates to reach across the aisle or to new groups of voters when trying to win office and potentially electoral college reform as well so that the popular vote winner is also the winner of the election uh, itself. So we have a few other solutions that we outline in the paper and I'm happy to take more questions about the United States in Q&A. Okay, well thank you very much. Um, so I want to talk about what causes populism. What are the big drivers? As Anna uh, and Didi have both pointed to the I would say conventional wisdom says that it's really about economic inequality. Uh, after a couple of generations of what's now called neoliberalism, globalization, uh, opening up of economies to international competition, we've had a big rise of inequality. Uh, and that uh, could explain why in the middle of the second decade of the 21st century, you got the rise of uh, populism. But if that were the only explanation, you would have to then further explain why it is that left-wing populist parties weren't the biggest beneficiaries, because these are the parties that basically want to redistribute wealth and income. They want to protect uh, vulnerable populations. And if you've got uh, working people that are being made more vulnerable by globalization, they should have, after the financial crisis in 2008 or the Euro crisis, uh, been the big winners. But instead, a lot of working class uh, voters whose incomes have been flat or falling have flocked to these right-wing parties. And I think that that indicates that there are other factors that you would broadly call cultural that are at work in which actually people may be voting against their economic uh, interest uh, because they're uh, aligned with certain cultural norms. Uh, our our uh, colleague uh, in the Stanford Political Science Department, Jonathan Rodden, actually I think has demonstrated quite convincingly that actually the strongest correlate uh, of who votes for a populist party across quite a few uh, at least rich countries is not social class. Uh, it really has to do with population density and geographical location. Uh, that people that live in big urban agglomerations with lots of pluralism and diversity and job opportunities and openness to the outside world tend to vote for liberal parties, uh, whereas populists live in <clears throat> second and third tier cities in the countryside. Uh, and that, you know, I think that population density uh, becomes kind of a proxy for culture that, 
the social norms that exist in big cosmopolitan cities are simply very different in terms of religion, uh, in terms of a whole host of uh, traditional uh, values and the like. Laid on top of this uh, is a question of race and ethnicity. I think that most people who have looked at the rise of the kind of polarization that Didi described in the United States would say that this really began with the Southern realignment in the 1960s. Uh, you know, prior to that point, the Democratic Party had included a lot of racist segregationists uh, 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 as part of its base. But in the 1960s, it embraced the Civil Rights Movement, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, and it began this long process of Southern whites migrating from the Democratic Party to the, um, to the Democratic Party, uh, such that increasingly the Republican Party has become a party of white voters and the Democratic Party has become a party of white professionals, educated white professionals and racial and ethnic uh, minorities. Uh, it's a little complicated in Europe. Uh, there's actually a kind of co uh, inverse correlation between actual diversity and voting for populist parties. So the truly diverse countries like Britain and, and France, uh, although they have uh, populist parties, have not seen the rise of <clears throat> dominant populist parties like in Poland and Hungary, which is a little bit odd if you think that immigration and ethnic identity are that important, uh, you know, why uh, should those countries with almost no immigration care? And I think it's really uh, based on a kind of fear that their existing ethnic identity, the existing uh, ethnic homogeneity uh, could be taken away from them as a result of high levels of, uh, of immigration. So <clears throat> I don't want to suggest that populism is all about race. Uh, and I think that would be a big mistake because there are genuine reasons why non-elites should resent elites. Uh, elites in both the United States and uh, Europe did things like, you know, get involved in the Iraq war or laid the groundwork for the great financial crisis or the Euro crisis or the migrant crisis in, in 2014. And so, it's not as if there's no reason for people to be upset with their management of these big policy issues. But I think that, you know, if you want to actually peel away the more reasonable part of the populist base and get them to vote once again for centrist parties, you've got to be able to separate in a certain sense, uh, illegitimate uh, uh, concerns, which I think are concerns that, you know, we're not Christian or we're not we're not white or we're not the right, you know, skin color. You have to separate those kinds of concerns for ones that are, I think, more legitimate, like, well, you know, we're a democracy, we should be able to control uh, our borders and decide who gets to uh, uh, live among us. We should worry about the way that globalization has impacted working class incomes and the like. So I will, I will end there. Thank you. Thank you all. That's terrific. Do, do either Anna or Didi want to say something in response to anybody else before we jump into the questions, or should we move to questions? Did somebody mute you, Anna? Oh, sorry. I am now unmuted. Um, okay. I just wanted to add that I think you know Frank is absolutely right about the kind of cultural and um, racial demographic fears that may be driving populism. And I think that's part of the reason why immigration is so cr such a critical third rail of an issue in both Europe and in the United States. It's also the main reason why the elitists are seen as being so unresponsive, because they're refusing to acknowledge these fears, um, whether they're legitimate or not in the eyes of some other people, um, and they're refusing to respond to them in a way that a lot of these voters find satisfactory. Great, Didi. Okay, let's jump in then. Uh, we have two dozen questions and I, I'll group them and add as I see fit. Um, lots of great questions here and some are from the same person. So I'm deliberately not going to name you <laughs> in case I can ask your questions twice. Uh, but the first one, first couple actually, just to, to drill down on it a little bit more. 
is on the definitional question and the kind of normative question that people are asking, a couple people are asking about what's so bad about populism. Uh, if it brings lights to the failures, it brings transparency to the failures of elites, isn't that representing the people's interests? Frank, you talked a little bit about this, but I wanted to give everybody a chance to say, back to Anna's original yeah. query about what is populism and what it is not. No, sure. So um, all democracies are supposed to be uh, responsive to popular opinion. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with people getting mad about elite management of, of you know, the economy or immigration or anything else. They ought to respond to that. But I think the real issue is the one that uh, Anna raised, which is that populists uh, end up being very anti-institutional. Uh, they say, uh, the people voted for me. Uh, I represent the people directly in an unmediated way. I don't need a party. I don't need you know uh, uh, all of the other kind of institutions that normally support politicians. I am the embodiment of the people's will, and therefore, if there's a, you know, there's a, a, a stupid judge that is telling me I can't do something, I am going to get rid of that judge. Or if there's a media critic, I'm going to uh, figure out how to silence that uh, that person. And that's why I think that um, uh, populist regimes tend to be very, you know, what's called personalist. It's all based on one's personal, oftentimes charismatic authority. It's not based on institutions, and I think. It's really important to remember that a liberal democracy is not just about popular will. It's popular will constrained by institutions that prevent that will from being used to violate citizens' rights, to concentrate excessive power in the executive. Uh, all of those things are a core feature uh, of liberal democracy, and I think that's really what's wrong with populism. Which, you know, um, well, I, you know, I, what I'd like to add is that, to what exactly, I think Frank's absolutely right. Um, what I would add is that the empirical pattern is that um, populist parties in opposition are incredibly useful. They precisely pinpoint the failures of um, elites. They pinpoint the failures of democratic politics, and they can serve as a very useful corrective. Um, we can look at the United States and, you know, the populist party around the turn of the century and the ways in which many of its demands were eventually incorporated into policy. The problem really occurs only when populists enter governments. When they're governing, and especially if they're governing by themselves without any constraint from coalition partners or the opposition, that's when we get into trouble. And that's when we see the kind of anti-institutional actions that Frank was describing. That's when they start to erode democracy. In the opposition, there's absolutely no problem with them. But in, as governor, uh, governors, they're really quite corrosive. And finally, I think a point that our paper makes is also a sort of defense of democratic politics as a sort of messy business. So the elite consensus, um, we wouldn't necessarily think of as per se bad if you know there's a general set of policies that the elites agree on. But the problem in a lot of the advanced democracies that have long been able to take formal democratic procedures and institutions for granted is that elite consensus has occurred while there has been citizen discontent and a, a sort of desire for more redress of certain problems or acknowledgement. And instead of engaging in battles in the legislature where elected officials are supposed to come together to deliberate in a public way, uh, we haven't seen that deliberation take place. And, and muting deliberation entirely through the election of populist leaders is not really the solution. Great. Uh, just so you know, we've had an explosion of questions now. We're up over 40, so that's, that's a very good sign. But a lot of them are related, and I'll try to group them together. There's an interesting question here about the relationship between elites, uh, and I'm trying to use our language of the paper, uh, you know, uh, translating in between what the questioner, the people asking questions are using, but elites on the one hand and state bureaucracy on the other. And is populism a function of the state bureaucracy not doing what the uh, those elected were intended and trying to do? I mean, this is a variation of this might be the deep state uh, as the it's used here in the United States. But what what do you what do you say about the failure of the state bureaucracy as one of the problems and causes leading to populist rises around the world? Frank, I'll go to you first. Okay. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, been a permanent tension in uh, 
in democracies because you can't really have a modern political system if you don't have a permanent bureaucracy. Uh, you need expertise. Uh, uh, you know, you need flight control, air traffic controllers. You need uh, medical professionals in your centers for disease control. You know, uh, you need astronauts in your air and space, you know, agency and this sort of thing. Uh, but those are not, you know, those are merit-based uh, kinds of positions and they are oftentimes not clearly subject to uh, democratic control. Now, I think that, I, I, frankly, I think a lot of the complaints about the deep state in this country are, are kind of uh, absurd, but I think you can make a stronger case in Europe where the structure of the European Union actually privileges the European Commission, which is the bureaucratic kind of executive arm of the EU that controls economic decision making over the more democratic ones, which would be the European Parliament. And so the U EU Commission is constantly making all of these annoying little rules about food labeling and, you know, safety regulations that really bother people. And uh, no one can figure out, uh, you know, how to stop it or how, how to get, you know, input into this bureaucracy. And I think the crisis in Britain really came to a head over the fact that a lot of European rules set by either courts or bureaucrats, that is to say branches that are not really subject to democratic uh, accountability, were making important rules about who could come into the, the country. So refugee rules, for example, this is not recognized. It's actually not set by the, um, it's not set by the European uh, 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 Union. It, it's set by the uh, European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Justice. And so you have these institutions that are telling countries you can't prevent this, you can't, uh, you know, send this terrorist back to their country uh, and we're the ones making the rules and not you, the democratic legislature in your country. So I do think that that is an issue, uh, uh, you know, and it, it requires balance. I mean, uh, uh, you can't let the bureaucracies get too far out of line with what people actually want them to do. Anna, do you want to say more on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's important to distinguish which aspects of the democracy we're talking about, or sorry, of the bureaucracy we're talking about. Um, and I think, if anything, what we observe is a pattern of populists attacking um, the bureaucracy, and, specific, any, and specifically any kind of oversight or regulatory institutions that would constrain the populace from pursuing self-interest, from politicizing the state, from basically handing out goodies to their friends. Um, so as, you know, more often than not, I think the bureaucracy is the target rather than simply a driver of populism. I also think that sometimes to the extent that people might think the bureaucracy is acting, at least in the United States, that's often due to the failures of representative institutions. So when Congress has not, and especially in recent years, since like yeah. 2011, 2010, um, when polarization became a really punctuated problem in Congress, when congressional inaction uh, is sort of the norm, then a lot of policymaking has occurred in the executive agencies through different changes to rulemaking. And that some of that might strike people as, um, you know, that those are not the accountable institutions, accountable to the public, that is. Um, but again, I think that that can be connected back to a failure of the mainstream parties too. Right, great. We have lots of questions related to disinformation and Facebook. And um, let me just read this one from somebody I think we all know, Maya Guzdar asked, your research identified this trust of elites and a divided society as being two reasons that populism has risen. To what extent do you all believe the introduction of the internet and disinformation has contributed to the rise of populism, seeing that often disinformation campaigns target trust in elites and divided societies? Well, I would say big time. <laughs> big time? <laughs> uh, you yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, in a sense, the old media space was controlled by elites. I mean, that's what elites do is that they, they're the editors and the publishers and the fact checkers uh, and so forth. And a lot of the uh, backlash is against them. And, and then what the internet permitted is you could actually get information without having all those mediating uh, elites getting in the way and anyone could post anything they wanted. And so uh, 
uh, and on the internet, one fact is as good as any other fact, even if it's not uh, not true. And so I think you know um, that's a direct way in which uh, unmediated channels of communication uh, become instruments for you know further undermining elite control. But Anna will probably have something further to say on this. Yeah, I, I mean, it strikes me that, you know, we've had populist movements before, and they've been wildly successful, whether in the United States or Argentina and so on, without the use of the internet and without this kind of diffusion of misinformation. But what I think um, both the social media platforms and the internet more broadly does is allow two things. One is it basically sort of makes it, it puts this misinformation on steroids, right? And so the messages can be delivered as if they're on steroids and spread much more quickly and much more efficiently. Secondly, it also makes it possible to anonymize this information. So we don't know where the misinformation is coming from or what right. the intentions of those actors are. Um, and that I think is, you know, Philip, that that's basically some, you know, an aspect of this that the internet makes possible that previous uh, dissemination platforms did not. Interesting. Didi, you want to comment on this? Or? No, I don't think disinformation is a unique cause of populism. I, I more just think it's a amplifier of some of the trends that Anna and Frank discussed and also provides another tool for some populist leaders also to use. They can also weaponize information. They can also make sure some information gets highlighted and other uh, less trusted. Um, and the overall effect is to sow more distrust in the population towards all forms of media, both legitimate or elite and traditional and new, um, which makes it even, even harder sometimes to get public consensus over some of the need to restore democracy moving forward. I did note in that it was in a paper, I think the New York Times today, uh, reporting on internal Facebook study of whether Facebook has contributed to polarization or not. And it said, uh, their findings said that it did not, but it was their findings and it was an internal study. Um, uh, so that doesn't help us too much. Maybe we'll interact with them in a more sustained way to test some of these hypotheses. And by the way, just to, to advertise, if I may, we all have another center at uh, FSI that all of us uh, are involved in in one way or another, especially Frank, called the Stanford Cyber Policy Center. Uh, and they do a lot of work on disinformation. So go and check out their website as well. Um, we have some questions about variation and prescription. So on first on variation, uh, one I know we've all tackled and uh, discussed before, why do populists rise in some European countries and not others? Why the United States and not Canada? That, I'm just adding that one. Why and, you know, just the, the, what explains the rise in some places and not? Um, and then uh, a very good question about, can you point to some examples in history and let me add in parentheses and maybe even our own history, American history, you were alluding to it earlier in the conversation that demonstrate how populism has been successfully defeated. Anna, why don't we start with you? Um, so on the first question on sort of, you know, the, the variation and the rise of populist parties and why they arise in some places than in others. Um, well, if our framework is correct, it's because in some places, the mainstream political parties, the parties that already exist and are on the ground, have done a good enough job of responding to the voters and addressing their concerns. Um, and that's why, you know, for example, in Canada, the, where the sort of the percentage of poll respondents who are satisfied with their party system is much higher than in the United States, you don't see the same kind of nationwide populist takeover, um, even if it's, you know, there are some places like Rob Ford in Toronto and others. And the same thing in Europe, where the where this of mainstream is functioning, um, there's very little room for populist parties to arise. Frank or Didi? Uh, yeah, I do think, however, that uh, it the the ground for this is also prepared by the actual society and the divisions that exist in the society. Uh, so, for example, Canada. Uh, and by the way, uh, Rob Ford or the current Ford that's now the premier of Ontario is actually doing a very good job. Uh, he's turning out to be very unlike Donald Trump in handling COVID. So I'm not sure he's a great example of, of populism, but uh, you know, Canada has not had uh, populism in this uh, extreme fear of immigration. They've actually got a much higher number of foreign born than the United States. But you know, part of that is that they don't have the racial history of the United States. You know, what the way I think of Canada is it's actually a lot like the United States minus the old Confederacy. 
you know, if you didn't have that whole history of racial division and, you know, you think about what that's done to the party structure in the United States, where essentially the South, the old South has kind of colonized the Republican Party and shifted it into this very angry, you know, uh, anti-establishment populist party. The grounds for that happening uh, in Canada just don't exist because, you know, they're, it's like, you know, they're sort of, the whole country is Minnesota. Um, so that's, you know, so I think you do have to look at the underlying sociology of, uh, of the society. Um, and I would also point out, oh, sorry, Ani, go ahead. No, I, was, I would just wanted to point out that, you know, that I just wanted to point out that there are plenty of countries in Europe that are basically uniformly, for example, Poland, right? 96% yeah. Catholic, almost entirely ethnically Polish, and yet a huge rise in populism. So again, I don't think there's an easy mapping of either economic crises or immigration regimes or even ethnography and demographics um, onto the rise of populism. On the question of how to defeat it, I will point out two other um, Mechanism. So Anna's right that parties can simply address the concerns of voters and um, establish more robust responsiveness mechanisms. And ideas in civil society are also important here, which is not really something we've discussed, but 2019 was a year of widespread protests around the world uh, asking for more, more democracy, like in places like Hong Kong, and also protesting corruption at the elite level and a lot of other places. Um, in, in the United States, for example, a populist movement that emerged was ultimately sort of solved by the New Deal, which really reconfigured the social contract between the state and citizens and social democratic governments in Europe, which did the same. Um, and we also know that there are populist ideas that have simply been beaten out by civil society. For example, you have populist tendencies and demagogues in the South during the era of segregation that were ultimately defeated by a civil rights movement. And there are any number of other pro-democracy movements that have also been enormously successful. So I think civic activity that has been renewed in an era of populism, um, at least in the United States, is promising. Interesting. Um, uh, related, there's a question here. It loops back a little bit to our conversation about social media, but it also relates to institutional design and, and prescriptives uh, for the future. It's from John Farajan, and he writes, normally first past the post or majoritarian systems repel minor parties. Right. Think, however, that in the United States, populism has manifested itself as a takeover of one of the parties. Do you think that social media in 2016 made this takeover possible, attenuating the prophylactic effect of majoritarian systems? So, that may be one uh, possible factor, but I'm interested in your other thoughts about it. In particular, you know, why isn't majoritarian uh, institutional design working the way it's supposed to in terms of pushing minority parties to the, the sidelines? Didi, I'm looking at you first, I guess. Right. So there's a good paper by Frances Lee, who's a political scientist at Princeton about populism in the United States. And she basically argues populism is sort of an underlying um, factor in our politics, sort of always, or at least it crops up in history, and that it emerges as a faction within a party. So uh, John, you're totally right that we don't have minor parties in the United States. We're not going to get populist parties. But uh, the GOP has um, trends of, for example, anti-statism or a sort of delegitimation of the state, lines about election uh, fraud or sort of concerns with voter fraud date back to Bush, uh, George W. Bush and Alberto Gonzalez going after voter fraud soon after they were elected in 2000. We've had concerns about election integrity since then, 2000, and Bush v. Gore. Um, so a lot of the sort of issues that Trump brought to the fore, and also not to mention the history of race and the Republican Party becoming increasingly the party of white voters um, that were brought to the fore by Trump, but I don't think they were uniquely caused by social media. So he picked up on a lot of existing strands in American politics. Um, and it's true that he has sort of driven the party in a much more radical direction, but that is also due to some, some patterns and uh, tendencies that were there long before he was. And so to the extent that populism was a faction, it's right now the dominant faction, but we can hope that the two party system can eventually resolve it through, um, you know, electing, through losing votes like in 2018 in the midterm elections. Anna, do you want to jump in, Frank? Um, I would just add that, I would just add that, and I think what makes this moment so interesting is that in the past, when you've had populism in the United States, for example, most of those claims were then co-opted by the mainstream parties, right? Mm -hmm. So 
Huey Long and the, the progressives were basically co-opted by the Democrats, Wallace and others were to a large extent co-opted by the Republicans. And what's interesting about this moment is that this is the first time that we see a co-optation of a major party by a populist um, right. in ways that seem to be fairly robust, um, at least given the performance of Congress over the last four years. I, I would make one other point. Didi and I were involved in a prior precursor project on American institutions and comparative perspective. And I think that one of the conclusions there was that polarization was not uh, the simple result of having a first-past-the-post electoral system, but it was also very much affected by things like popular primaries, uh, because once you shift it to popular primaries, you know, the only people that vote in primaries are uh, activists, and in both the Democratic, but especially in the Republican Party, it was really the activists that then took it over in the form of the Tea Party, and then, you know, the insurgencies that, that brought uh, Trump to power, uh, and um, and basically that happened in the Democratic Party in 2016 with the rise of Bernie Sanders, so that the popular primaries have basically weakened the elite party structure's ability to control the party and therefore, you know, push candidates that would be more appealing to median voters, and you get therefore you know more extreme candidates arising. Right, and just to remind you all, uh, I think Dee Dee mentioned it, or maybe on in the beginning, we we talk about some of these other institutional factors, including uh, uh, you know gerrymandering, redistricting that leads to uh, less incentives for more moderate candidates. So, um, by all means, please read the paper. Uh, we've got a ton of questions here, folks. See, with a, the numbers keep exploding, so I'm going to try to group a few of them together as we wind down. We have about nine minutes left. Uh, lots of questions about definitions, which I think is legitimate. The, there are some elastic terms here, including the word populism itself. Um, let's let's go through this as kind of three different ones, both definitional and causal. One is take another run, somebody at defining elites uh, for our listeners. Uh, two, uh, Dan Snyder asks a very important question about what are the differences between populist parties today and populist, nationalist, fascist parties during the interwar period. Uh, are these similar or different things? Uh, and a related third question, if you have a, a, a bitter experience with populism, uh, does that inoculate you in the future? Is that one of the things, is that one of the things that causes variation? Anna, let's start with you. Okay, um, so on defining the elites, you know, the, for the populace, the elites are basically the cartel up top, right? So it is business elites, it is political party elites, it is politicians, it is the media elites, it is academics, to some extent, it's the state elites. Um, all of that is grouped together as basically the people who make decisions and who don't care about us. Um, and in many ways, the phrase, that term is deliberately left undefined. So it can be basically, you can project a lot of things onto it, um, including, of course, a streak of anti-Semitism that's being seen increasingly in the populist parties, um, both here and in Europe. Um, when it comes to this idea of, you know, what's, what differentiates the populist today from the fascist of yesterday, yesterday um, I think there are two main differences. One is that populism doesn't present a coherent ideology. There isn't a coherent view of what society, economy, and politics ought to look like. It's much more of a criticism than sort of you know, a plan forward. Um, secondly, there, the militant aspect of it is still missing, right? So the fascists and communists both were more than willing, were more than willing to use force and violence to achieve their ends. Populists are not. Um, populists very much play, they play by democratic rules to enter office, even if they erode democracy afterwards. But they are not militant or violent in the ways that fascists and communists were. On the, question, on the question of whether or not you can be sort of inoculated against populism, I think that, um, like Anna was saying before, when the mainstream parties adopt the concerns of populists and address them, that is a somewhat, somewhat of a form of inoculation in that you are getting at some of the root causes of the populism, the populist criticisms. Um, and another way is that because some of our solutions in the paper, especially those calling for sort of more rhetoric denouncing a liberal moves by populist leaders or more coalitional politics, that can also be a, a sort of a recommitment to, 
democratic principles in a very basic way um, without widespread political reform that at least um, creates a signaling device to the electorate about the values that, and the values and bright lines, I suppose, that exist in a polity. Um, that may not be a long-term inoculation, but at least are a very public declaration of what is and is not acceptable. You know, we're going through a very interesting uh, experiment right now. So two of the three worst performers in the COVID crisis are Brazil and the United States, and they're both being run by populist uh, presidents who arguably played a big role in making their performance, uh, the performance of their countries as bad as it is. Uh, and that might be a lesson that, you know, might sink in uh, with people that, uh, you know, it's one thing if your complaint is, uh, well, you know, president just saying these nasty things on Twitter about journalists. It's another thing if you face a big national disaster that's staring you in the face as a result of this kind of populism but we'll have to see. Great answers. Um, there's a, several questions here dancing around a theme that uh, I think we should address. We did in the beginning, but I think we should take another run at it, which is, um, you know, more, more of a basic uh, explanation that this is all driven by economics. This is driven by the loss of manufacturing jobs here in the United States, the China effect. Um, what's the right framework for uh, addressing that alternative, or I would say complementary, perhaps, explanation for the rise of populism. The questions are about the United States uh, that I'm reading, and I, I apologize if I'm not getting a chance to read all the questions, but, but we could also talk about it with relation to Europe or other parts of the world. So what about it's just simple economics, and this is a natural consequence of the loss of manufacturing jobs going to China. China is to blame for our populist rise in America. I mean, I think the reason that we avoid trying to settle on a causal explanation in the paper is that there, it's just really hard to know. A lot of these things are impossible to extricate from one another. So just in debates in academia about the United States, you'll find people saying that it's white status anxieties, that it's racial resentment, or that it's economic anxieties. Ultimately, a lot of these things um, are, are work together um, in tandem. So it would be really hard to know what the actual quote right frame is. I do think that the definition that we've laid out that Anna so clarified that populism is really about us versus them, about a corrupt cartel at the top that doesn't care about you, that's really the right way to think about these things, about the way you draw boundaries around who's sort of a legitimate part of the electorate and who's not, and which leaders are doing something for you and which ones aren't, rather than what is it that motivates populist voters per se, because it's very difficult to get at. Anna? Um, you know, I think the when it comes to economics as the explanation for populism, I think we ought to know that beyond the United States, there are countries that have had an economic crisis that don't see populism arising, like Portugal or Ireland. And conversely, you have countries that sailed through economic crises and yet saw populists arising, like Poland or even Finland. Um, so I think the relationship is at best um, indirect. And fundamentally, it's also moderated by who is to blame, right? So we could just as easily blame um, NAFTA, we could blame the uh, economic policies of the Clinton years, we can um, blame all kinds of decisions made by American policymakers, but it's so much easier to blame China. Um, and with, with that, all the sort of you know, xenophobia that comes with, uh, with that. I would also say that in the United States, you know, when it comes to party responsiveness, um, given the deaths of despair, given the opioid epidemic, the only candidate to mention that, to speak to it seriously in 2016 was Donald Trump. Um, and I think that made a lot of people feel like they were being finally heard, like their pain was finally being felt by one of the politicians. Frank? Oh, I, I would point to the fact that, um, well, so everything is correct, like a very complicated, uh, you know, status, cultural anxieties get mixed up with economic ones. What I find interesting though, and convinces me that the cultural stuff is very important are the number of cases you can point to where people have voted against, clearly against their economic self-interest because they're lining up in these tribal cultural you know, teams. Uh, and you're, you're seeing it in the COVID crisis, right? All these uh, uh, Trump supporters going to anti-shutdown rallies, hugging each other, you know, to, you know, ex ex potentially exposing themselves to a deadly disease, uh, 
because they you know, think that showing solidarity with their team is more important than you know, their personal health. So that's not economically rational uh, behavior. So we have uh, exactly two minutes left and I have over 90 questions still pending. So uh, I apologize for those that I didn't get to all your questions. Please be in touch with us on Twitter or other ways. Uh, somebody had a technical good suggestion for the future for our team, which is we should have the names of our participants below and have that so people can see. If you move your, your cursor, you can see the names, at least on my Zoom. But I think that's a great suggestion for the future, and we will do that for uh, uh, future FSI uh, seminars here on Zoom. So this is a speed round for everybody. Um, we'll start with Frank, Didi, and Anna will get the last word. Um, great set of questions here. One is, is there a transnational effect going on here? That is, are there mimic, uh, mimicking going on after Brexit and the election of Donald Trump? Second related, is populism rising or is it receding uh, after 2016? And then third, many people have asked in the fight against populism in their countries, and I wanna note that there are people from all over the world watching this today, right now, what can individuals do in their own communities to try to address some of these ill, um, you know, these dangerous trends of populism that we've been discussing? Uh, everybody gets about 30 to 45 seconds uh, to tackle these very big questions. Frank, you get the first shot. Uh, well, yes, the first one, uh, clearly there is a populist international. Uh, uh, you know, we've had a long discussion of the way that the Russians are trying to deliberately stoke this and there's clearly learning and fellow feeling between populists. And so, yes, there is plenty of imitation. Uh, just on that last question, I think the single way that you defeat populist is you go vote. Yeah. You go vote for another party that's, you know, a more liberal party that is not a uh, 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 prey to that. That in a democracy is really the only way you're going to do it. And just, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Frank, but I think when you use the word liberal party, you didn't mean... Uh, yeah, I mean uh, not populist, uh, yeah. not, yeah. Uh, there's been some confusion in the uh, Q&A yes. on, on the way we've been using the word liberal, and I wanted to clarify that. Didi. Not in the American sense, yeah. Yes, yeah. Dee. Um, on the question of rising or receding, I think that the crisis has provided a pretext, the, the COVID crisis has provided a pretext for populist leaders to clamp down even more and try to centralize power, particularly in the countries that Anna was discussing. Um, but that's, you know, we see that happening in the United States, and we just need to be vigilant about it. Um, and finally, what individuals can do, I completely echo Frank, this is something we say in the paper as well, is vote, exercise your most basic democratic right, fight for your right to vote as well, um, and try to support parties and efforts that, um, that you know, maintain the robust democracy that we were long accustomed to. Honor, you get the last word. Um, well, I, I would agree with my distinguished colleagues. Um, and all I would add is, yes, please vote. It's the single biggest difference you can make. Well, thank you all. This has been a terrific discussion, both our panelists, but the questions were just fantastic. So I really appreciate the engagement. I encourage you all to go get the paper and download it. And I also encourage you to go to the website because there are literally dozens of papers. They're very short ones too, right, Anna? Uh, so you don't have to, uh, ours is a rather long paper. There are many short papers that, that, that address virtually every uh, question that was asked here today. I encourage you to go get them. And Tune in for future podcasts, Zoomcasts, whatever we call these uh, here at FSI, including tomorrow we have several uh, available and the next week of, and the following weeks here at FSI Central. Thank you all for being here. Bye-bye.